Hello, everyone, and welcome to the closing panel of our 2022 conference. I wanted to take a moment to thank our sponsors for bringing all of our programming to you over the past two days. After the closing conference, everybody will receive a follow-up email from us. In that email is, again, your individual session surveys to fill out, but then additionally an overall conference survey. If you could please fill out that survey for us so that we can um, learn what we should improve for years, what you loved this year, um, that would be extremely helpful for us. So this is a packed panel and we want to make sure that we got to get to every question that was asked here today. So we're just going to jump right in and I'm going to introduce our panelists. So today with us, we have Matt Yergelin. Matt is a gastrointestinal uh, medical oncologist at the Dana-Farber Center Can Cancer Institute with a long-standing political and research interest in hereditary cancer syndromes, particularly Lynch syndrome. He manages and treats patients with a wide array of gastrointestinal malignancies. He has served as the director of the Dana-Farber Lynch Syndrome Center since its inception in 2019 and also serves as the director of clinical research for the Dana-Farber Center for Cancer Genetics and Prevention. Next, we have Heather Chang, who is an associate professor in medicine, the oncology division at the University of Washington, an associate member of the Division of Clinical Research at the Fred Hutch Cancer Center, and is director of the Prostate Cancer Center Genetics Clinic. She is a medical oncologist specializing in genitourinary cancers with a clinical and translational research focus on the germline and somatic genetics of prostate cancer. Next, we have Allison Curran, who is a professor of medicine and epidemiology and population health co-leader of the Stanford Center Institute Population Sciences Program, director of the Stanford Women's Clinical Cancer Genetics Program, and associate chief of the oncology division at Stanford University. Dr. Karyan's research focuses on the identification of women with elevated breast and gynecologic cancer risk and on the development and evaluation of novel techniques for early cancer detest detection and risk reduction. Gloria Huang is an internationally known expert in the treatment and prevention of ovarian, uterine, and cervical cancers. Dr. Wang is skilled at minimally invasive surgery and is the principal investigator of federally funded cancer research laboratory. Karen Hurley is a clinical psychologist specializing in hereditary cancer risk, counseling individuals, families, and couples with a variety of cancer genetic syndromes. So as I mentioned, we have a lot of questions that came in. We are going to try to answer them all before we close out today. The first question that we had came in, come in was for you, Matt, actually. This constituent said, I had heard about a recent study that questioned the benefit of colonoscopy. Does that study affect your recommendations for people with Lynch syndrome or other inherited mutations that increase colorectal cancer risk? This is a great question, and it's certainly hot off the presses. Um, as, as people may be aware, just a few days ago, there was a large high-profile study that came out of Europe um, which generate a lot of headlines in the press. I think some of those headlines kind of missed the mark a little bit and in my mind gave the impression that colonoscopies might not be as beneficial as we thought. Um, the study, when you really looked at it, was actually more so looking at how we offer colonoscopies and how we get people in for colorectal cancer screening. If you look at the, at the details of the study, the people who actually got colonoscopies had substantially fewer colorectal cancers than the people who did not. The problem was a lot of the people who were recommended to get colonoscopies in this study didn't actually get them. Um, so to me, the punchline is that colorectal cancer screening works if you do it. Um, and I think what the study shows to me is that we have a lot of work to do still on our end about how we engage um, individuals in colorectal cancer screening to begin with, how we get them in the front door, because otherwise, if, if we're not getting them screened, it's not going to work. Um, additionally, this study was really looking at colonoscopies in average risk individuals, um, and to me, it doesn't really give us much useful information as to what to do in our um, individuals with Lynch syndrome or other forms of inherited colorectal cancer risk, where in my mind, colonoscopies are still really the mainstay of how we try to prevent colorectal cancer. Excellent. Thank you. And you actually answered my follow-up question in your first answer. So we can 
Perfect. move to the next question. And that next question is going to be um, for you, Gloria and Allison, as well, if you would like to add. This constituent says, I am a 30-year-old breast cancer survivor with BRCA1 mutation preparing for oophorectomy in the next one to two years after I complete childbearing. What are your thoughts on hysterectomy with oophorectomy, both for uterine cancer risk reduction and eliminating the need for progesterone with possible future HRT? Yes, uh, also a very good question. So the most important um, component of gynecological risk reduction is removal of the complete fallopian tube and ovaries, um, bilateral salpingo ophorectomy. And that uh, dramatically reduces the risk of ovarian cancer and the related cancers that fall under that umbrella, fallopian tube cancer, which is the site of most um, of the pelvic uh, high-grade cancers, the fallopian tube fimbria, and the per primary peritoneal cancer, again, um, a related cancer under the umbrella of ovarian cancer. So um, that's really the most um, standard and critical portion of the risk reduction. In terms of the indications for removal of the uterus hysterectomy at the time, which can also almost always be performed minimally invasively, with a quite a quick recovery time, um, there are that is something that is um, a shared decision making uh, based on individual factors and individual wishes. So, um, in terms of this particular patient, um, in terms of her breast cancer history and whether or not she um, has um, plans to go on hormone replacement therapy or not. Um, as she is alluding to, women who don't have a uterus can have um, estrogen replacement therapy alone without the um, concurrent progesterone, which is really to protect the uterus from overstimulation from the estrogen. Um, however, the um, benefits of estrogen replacement therapy do outweigh some of the benefits of the combined therapy. So um, women who've had risk-reducing um, salpingo ophrectomy and does relate does result in early menopause uh, for women without contraindications. Um, many or most women um, who are before the age of natural menopause can safely take hormone replacement therapy, um, either combined estrogen and progesterone um, for women who have a uterus um, or um, estrogen alone. Now the concern with when estrogen replacement um, is given alone in women who don't have a uterus, there are some benefits, um, which actually um, some studies suggest could even um, have uh, protection against breast cancer. So whereas the um, combined therapy for um, women who have undergone premenopausal risk-reducing salpingoephrectomy may negate the potential additional protection of against breast cancer for women undergoing early salpingoephrectomy. There's a lot of information there. So that's just sort of summarizing some generalities. Of course, some other indications for hysterectomy may be shared across women in the general population. So some women, some of the common reasons people have hysterectomy include symptomatic fibroids, unresponsive to medical therapy, um, persistent severe cervical dysplasia, um, and things like that. So, of course, some of these common conditions can also occur in women who have um, hereditary predispositions. Thank you. Allison, anything you would like to add to that very comprehensive answer? Yeah, that was excellent, Dr. Hong. Thank you. I, I think as a breast cancer doctor, which is one of the main hats I wear, my main worry would be hormone replacement therapy of any kind in a breast cancer survivor, right? So that's the concern here. And, and it's always a hard thing to have to have to say because of course it would help with symptoms but i do worry about the concerns for breast cancer recurrence of doing that whether it be estrogen or progesterone i think it's something that generally we don't like to do i know that sometimes in patients with triple negative breast cancer some oncologists feel differently it continues to worry me just the issue of hormone replacement in a breast cancer survivor so i'll put that out there Thank you. Excellent. And so we do have a follow-up question there from the chat, actually, um, asking about screenings 
after surgery. So what type of follow-up is needed after risk-reducing removal of ovaries, tubes, and uterus? Do women who are BRCA1 positive, Lynch syndrome positive, still need six to 12 month ultrasounds and CA125s? Yes, that may be one for me as well. Um, so um, I do not um, uh, mandate uh, serial transvaginal ultrasounds after risk-reducing surgery. Um, I do recommend regular follow-up with GYN examinations. And of course, awareness, awareness of any changes or symptoms, which should always prompt um, a medical evaluation. Um, and again, in terms of the um, CA-125, Again, shared decision making and individualized, and that's something that you know I do offer because trends or changes can alert to a potential problem, um, but one single value alone may not be very helpful. Excellent. Um, we had this next constituent right in, and it is um, for you, Heather. Um, my father is seventy three with a BRCA two mutation, and his primary care doctor said he does not have to have prostate cancer screening. Based on this advice, he has decided not to. He is in good health, but I'm concerned that this is risky. Is it? How do I convince him to go for screening? Um, he doesn't like to see doctors in general. So can you provide screening guidelines? And then Karen, maybe you can also jump in as well to talk about um, kind of tactics as a caregiver for having these difficult conversations. Yeah, I think this is a really important question and it sort of follows on themes that Matt answered, I think, with the colonoscopy issue. And it's sort of, um, you know, there was a period of time um, where we had a lot of good intentions with PSA screening in the average risk population and then learned we were over treating people with average risk with over um, and then the pendulum swung against PSA screening. And I think what was lost in that messaging was that people who have risk factors, um, family history of prostate cancer, but certainly having a BRCA2 mutation, which we know increases the risk of prostate cancer substantially. Um, and there are some updated guidelines which suggest both AUA, the American Urological Association, as well as the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, starting at age 40 with a PSA. Um, for men with BRCA mutations and then shared decision making for BRCA1, um, CHECK2 and some of the sort of moderate penetrance risk genes. But I think for um, BRCA2, I would I would encourage it because um, as probably, you know, this audience doesn't need convincing, early detection can really mean um, better outcomes in terms of uh, cure from prostate cancer. So if we can find it earlier, um, we know, you know, um, then you don't need the sort of toolbox that I talked about in, in my session of, you know, all the, the PARP inhibitors. We'd rather not need any of that, right? I, I'd rather not give androgen deprivation therapy. So I guess that would be um, hopefully something that could be um, discussed. And, and Karen probably has some strategies for that. But I think um, the guidelines have changed. That's something that many primary care providers may not necessarily be up to date on. Hopefully that message will uh, percolate into uh, primary care and urology, but um, but there definitely is a role for for prostate cancer screening and um, for men with BRCA two, and and I think being supportive and consistent and um, is 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 the way to go. And then and then I'll, I'll hand it over to Karen. <laughs> yeah, thanks thanks so much, and that's. Um, uh, you know, and I, it really helps to have the uh, the technical information. So a couple of points I would say is number one, dad may not like going to the doctor in general, but does seem to have a trusting relationship with this one PCP in particular. So that's good. And you want to start by supporting that relationship. Uh, so a, a, a potential lead in to introduce new information into that existing relationship is to say something along the lines of, hey, dad, I just went to this really great conference and learned all kinds of new things um, in ways in which BRCA prostate issues are different from most guys, and, you know, and, and that your doctor may have treated men who got uh, erectile dysfunction after uh, having a prostate issue or may have incontinence issues, but 
you know, this is a situation where, you know, you may, they, they, um, they screen differently and they have different meds. I mean, this kind of elides over, you know, what you were talking about, about when PARP inhibitor, inhibitors get introduced, but just the fact that BRCA prostate cancers behave differently and they need special guidance and that, um, and that this, that force offers the opportunity both to talk to other men who can give more trusted information that he can take back to his doctor and or specialists who may be able to supplement the care that he's already giving or that he's already getting. Excellent. Thank you, Karen. And yes, to your point, our helpline um, support meetings are we have them for all diseases, all mutations, um, all types of different life stages that people are in. So there is a pretty good chance that if you go onto our support site, you'll be able to be matched with our um, peer navigators to find somebody who um, can really speak to the same experience that you're having. So that was a, a great a great thing to say there. Um, in terms of screening, I do want to take a question from the chat and transition. Um, this specific um, attendee is asking how effective, and this is going to be for you, Allison, how effective is high-risk breast cancer screening, alternating 3D mammos and MRIs? At what stage is cancer typically identified via the screening and what is typically required for that stage? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And I think we've known about certainly MRI-based breast screening, as I would call it, for quite a while now with the first studies coming from various countries, Canada, Europe, and the US in the early 2000s. So some of them now are reporting in long-term follow-up. And there was a nice study by Ellen Warner's group in Canada that looked at long-term survival in 20-year follow-up of screening women with MRI and mammogram and seeing what I think many of us thought was excellent long-term survival with fortunately very few episodes of people having died from breast cancer. So that was very encouraging. In general, when you look at the data from these studies, the cancers that they find tend to be detected in stage one, so smaller than two centimeters, two centimeters or smaller without axillary lymph node involvement. Sometimes there will be some diagnosed at higher stages, but one is the most common. And in some of the studies with BRCA2, particularly, we also see a lot of stage zero, so detection with carcinoma in situ, not even invasive, which is good. So I think all of that is very encouraging. We know that screening is not the same thing as prevention for breast cancer. We know that it is not exactly the same approach as, for example, prophylactic mastectomy. There have not been randomized trials comparing the two, but there have now been some long-term observational studies, including some out of the Netherlands, that again, I think are quite reassuring for showing quite good survival outcomes with both screening and surgery, either of those alternatives for women with BRCA1 and BRCA2. Excellent, thank you. Um, Moving from screening, um, Matt, this question is for you, a constituent wrote in because they want to know what they can proactively do for themselves beyond screening. Um, so they just want to know what is the latest advice supported by studies specifically on what Lynch syndrome providers might be able to do to proactively maintain their health? What are your thoughts on daily aspirin and supplements? Sure. So I think first, of the first of all, just good common sense, healthy living does make a real difference here. I think sometimes we give people the sense that, you know, your genes are your destiny and it doesn't matter what you do otherwise, but no, the data would actually show otherwise that the, the healthy living stuff does make a difference. Now, we don't necessarily have really fine detail about specific types of diets, specific types of exercise, um, you know, or if there is something more specific than that um, to advise people on. But I, for the most part, I tell people that good quality, healthy living, whether it's dietary wise, whether it's exercise, does make a real difference. In Lynch syndrome, we do have a few specific uh, tips um, that, that are based on some really important scientific data. Um, one is aspirin. Um, the CAP2 study, which was a large European study that looked at aspirin only in individuals with Lynch syndrome, essentially showed that for people who are taking daily aspirin, they had about 40 to 50% fewer new colon cancers than people who were taking a placebo in, in this one study. Um, 
So I tend to recommend aspirin for many of my Lynch syndrome uh, patients who I follow, but I don't think it's a one size fits all. Um, as with anything that people take, there can be unintended consequences. Aspirin can raise the risk of bleeding. It can raise the risk of irritation of the stomach, gastritis or ulcers. It was also a very delayed benefit that was seen. Um, people who were taking aspirin didn't really statistically see that prevention for at least five years and, and really closer to to 10 years. Um, and so I think people who benefit from aspirin and Lynch syndrome um, are probably more likely to be the younger people who have, you know, 40, 50 plus years of life in front of them rather than people in their 60s or 70s. Additionally, people who are older are probably more likely to get some of the side effects and, and the potential complications of aspirin. So I, again, I don't think it's a one size fits all. And then lastly, from a, if you want to call it a supplement standpoint, it's, it's maybe more of a dietary standpoint. There were data that just came out earlier this summer looking at this notion of what we call resistant starch. Um, as part of the same study that looked at aspirin, actually, there was this second intervention where people were randomized to be put on a daily dose of resistant starch, again, versus a placebo. Originally, this was considered kind of a negative study because they were looking at whether or not it reduced colorectal cancer incidence in Lynch syndrome. It did not. Um, but what their latest analysis showed was that Lynch syndrome patients who were taking this daily resistant starch had a substantially lower rate of upper GI tract cancers. So cancers of the stomach, the small intestine, the pancreas, and the bile duct, which are disproportionately the lethal cancers in Lynch syndrome and the ones that we are not very good at screening for. Um, there's a lot of theories as to why this might have been seen, and, and I don't think we know the answer quite yet. Um, but the idea of resistant starch is a little bit more murky to people. What is resistant starch? Um, the good news is that uh, the, the authors of the study broke it down to say that the amount of resistant starch, which is essentially a type of fiber that they used in this study, was the equivalent of what you would find in one green banana per day. Um, now, I realize not everybody likes green bananas, uh, but at the very least, that, that hopefully helps just put it into perspective as to what that might look like. And you can talk to a nutritionist or a dietitian about um, other sources of resistant starch. But w point being, we're starting to learn more about things that patients themselves can do to, to really, uh, you know, take some of this prevention into their own hands. Excellent. Thank you. Gloria, did you want to jump in here and add something as well? Yes, I just wanted to add a few comments about um, endometrial cancer as one of the um, common cancers in, um, that uh, women with Lynch syndrome are at risk for, as well as a quite a common uh, cancer in the general population. So um, we do know that some very common um, things such as um, types of con commonly used contraception decreases the risk of endometrial cancer as well as ovarian cancer. I didn't mention that before. Um, so uh, oral contraceptive pills, for example, um, and also um, uh, progesterone IUDs um, are likely to have protection from, against endometrial cancer. And um, with oral contraceptive pills, the protection can be long lasting. So many years after stopping um, birth control pills. For example, in um, BRCA1 and 2 carriers, there was protection seen over 15 years after stopping use of oral contraceptive pills. So I did want to mention those, as well as um, things that, at least in the general population, are protective. Um, so I think um, already mentioned in terms of healthy lifestyle, the physical activity, maintaining a healthy body weight, um, and um, and also for women who have children, you know, having prolonged breastfeeding can be protective as well. Thank you. Do you Allison, do you want to touch on any of those protective measures um, with regards to people who also have a high risk for breast cancer? Right. I think that's always the touchy question with oral contraceptives, and I think that may have come up in, in one of the other questions. So, you know, it, it again has very good data on protection in terms of reduction in ovarian cancer risk. There's been controversy about the potential of an increase in breast cancer risk with birth control pills for people with BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations. There have been meta-analyses, and I think the most recent one found that there was perhaps a slight increase in risk. So what we think of as perhaps a 20% increase maybe. So again, not huge, although, although certainly something to be thinking about when one is at higher risk to start with. What I recall from, from the meta-analysis was that really only seemed to be in women using oral contraceptive pills for more than five years. 
So it is this balancing act of could you do five years with the aim of ovarian cancer risk reduction, but then stay under the wire for breast. I don't think we know enough to be as exact as that in our recommendations, but, but those are some of the challenges that people face in thinking about it. Excellent. So we're talking about preventative measures now. I want to call our attention to a question that came through in the chat. Um, Karen, I kind of want you to feel this one first so that we can talk about the emotional implications of what this user is asking. So, and then we can address the second part of the question, which is medical. Um, so regarding screening for transvaginal ultrasounds, what would be the next step uh, if a lesion is found and is seen on or near an ovary? And Karen, I, I want you to speak to a little bit of your presentation that was um, recorded earlier about navigating life's detours, because this seems like it is a detour and something that was unexpected and emotionally just how um, so much have handled that. And then we can follow up with kind of the medical next steps that would take place. Right. Yeah. And I think that the very first uh, thing is to recognize that that moment of of hearing uh, lesion, you know, um, you know, this is before it even starts getting worked up uh, or having additional imaging is um, a lot of people will either experience um, shock, you know, they might have an experience like they feel like they're in a fog or it's not real or like they're in a movie or that they want to immediately jump into action. Right. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, almost like a, a panic situation or going into um, what you might call a battle mind mode. OK. OK. Just tell me what to do and, and, and really pushing. And so uh, both of those psychological states make it hard to do what I'm about to say, which is take a breath. That's the time when we least likely want to do it and the time when we most need to, right? So the other thing about this kind of situation, which is really tough, is that there are going to be these moments of get some information and wait, get some information and wait, um, and that those waiting periods in between can be uh, very stressful. So two things can work. Number one, this is where one day at a time holds a great deal of power. You know, it's such a commonplace phrase, but um, this is this is when um, it truly um, it truly can be helpful as a as a discipline, right? To not run ahead of the information that you currently have. Right. And then the other thing is that during those wait periods, this is when you want to use distraction as healthy coping. Um, so things that hold your attention lightly, you know, this is where you uh, watch that movie that you've already watched 10 times, but it's still kind of funny. Or um, you have something that you can put attention on to you know, like a jigsaw puzzle or, you know, like, or taking walks with someone, doing activities that are comforting and familiar to, um, to uh, go through that time, uh, maybe minimizing some demands, handing off some uh, things that are particularly stressful. Um, and uh, because the person may not be aware, uh, you know, how much that, uh, that, stress is going to start eating into their ability to concentrate. Yeah, and thank you for that answer because it actually answers another question that was in the chat as well. It was very prescriptive for what to do when you are going or waiting for an appointment to happen and you are feeling nervous. So uh, that answer really covered a lot of our bases there. Um, Allison and Gloria, do you want to speak to the next steps that need to be taken medically um, when a result like that comes back? Laurie, would you like to begin? <laughs> Either one. Yes, um, yes, I was really uh, paying attention so much to what Karen was saying that going back to the original question, can you refresh the, um, my memory Absolutely. about what this scenario was? Sure, so it's regarding a screening, transvaginal ultrasound, um, what would be the next step if a lesion is seen on or near the ovary? Yes. So, you know, in this situation, so ovaries, especially during reproductive years, are quite active. And so the, 
the how the ovaries appear will fluctuate over the menstrual cycle. And um, so it really, if it says a cyst, you know, really depends on features of the, the cystic lesion on the ovary. Certain cysts actually develop every menstrual cycle and follicular cysts and the dominant follicle. And if someone is ovulating, then the corpus luteum, which is the cyst that um, is formed after the, the oocyte is released. So, um, you know, it's really important not to um, be overly concerned about a functional cyst. On the other hand, if there's a cyst that's concerning, um, sometimes um, additional imaging and blood tests and other testing as well as a physical exam will be needed. And sometimes a, um, a surgical procedure such as a laparoscopic procedure for further evaluation. Um, but it is very much a one step at a time, you know, ha not jumping ahead to any conclusions. And as Karen said, you know, one taking it one step at a time with breaths in between, um, because many of these can be false alarms. Unfortunately, that's the nature of transvaginal ultrasounds is that there are a lot, a lot of false positives. And if I may, I want to um, uh, add something onto that, which is, you know, really informative, is in this day and age of um, opening of medical records and results being released to charts, is that you want to be active in planning how you're going to receive a result um, after an ultrasound. Um, you And to actually create a, a notification plan. Um, if you just, you know, if you look at the, if you get a message that says, oh, you have a new result and you click on it and, you know, who knows where you are, what you're doing uh, at that time. So to either wait until you're going to see your doctor or uh, to uh, plan to call someone to sit with you while you look at the result who can help you hold that space of, you're looking at what the radiologist or the the, the um, person who has signed out the um, the study is saying, which might be different from how your doctor talks to you about it, right? So you're going to see the more the more hedging, more uh, well, it could be this uh, kind of a situation, which may not actually um, apply to you. So um, uh, it, it's it's worth being thoughtful about. Uh, having support around looking at your results when you're not in the doctor's office. Yeah, that is an excellent point. Allison, do you have anything that you want to add there? No, I defer to the experts who just spoke. <laughs> Fair. Can Fair. I just chime in a little bit on that one too? Because yes. I think that even though, you know, prostate cancer is a very different disease, there are some common themes and you know, amongst just in general with screening and when there's results. And I would encourage people, I try to do this with, with my patients, but sometimes it's helpful even before you do a study to just talk through the different scenarios of what might happen next, just as the, you know, if this, then this, sometimes that can be a little bit helpful just so you know at least what, what might be the next study or or not, even before the results come back, just, just um, because it can be I think, as Karen mentioned, it can be pretty overwhelming. So just having an idea of the, the possibilities and uh, can help contain the worry a little. Yeah, and Heather, I actually want to kind of stay where you are when talking about thinking about next steps, because we did have a constituent write in that was, they said that they had metastatic prostate cancer with an ATM mutation, and they're considering clinical trials. So now they're thinking into the future, but they're not sure how to access them, their doctor hasn't offered it yet. Can you speak to a little bit about how um, people can begin to access clinical trials, the conversations they should have with their doctors? And Matt, I'm sure our Lynch syndrome um, patients here would be interested to hear that from you as well. Yeah, I think it's, it's hard to answer without a lot of specifics. The first though, I would say is with an ATM mutation, it's definitely something that I would say is uh, helpful to know and keep in mind and planning for the future. So the, I'd applaud the question asker and saying, you know, it's great 
um, that you're thinking about it proactively and you're considering clinical trials. Sometimes it's that there isn't a particular trial for the exact disease state you're in, and that may be one reason. So it's certainly worth asking your provider um, about that specific question, are there trials for me? And um, depending on where you are, there may be trials or it may be that there's not, uh, you're not in your disease state isn't one where there is a therapeutic trial or a treatment-based trial. There are sometimes registry trials where we're gathering information. I think in my talk, I introduced one called Promise. Um, and then sometimes it's helpful to to look at clinicaltrials.gov or the FORCE website is really nicely organized to sort of guide people to opportunities. Um, and then sometimes it makes sense to get a second opinion just to make sure that there isn't something else or that you hear it in a different way, um, or there may potentially be different trial opportunities at a different center. Um, I will say, so ATM is something we're really interested in, but um, I think we're still learning about whether or not it has the same prediction for PARP inhibitors in the prostate cancer setting, and it looks like they're more complicated. Um, and so I tell my patients, if you if you don't need anything right away, if you have other options, and we're fortunate in advanced prostate cancer to have many options, it may be worth not necessarily automatically going to a PARP inhibitor, but trying to do it just as this question asked, asker was asking, see if we can get on a trial because maybe you know, that might give an opportunity for the next, you know, iteration or advancing um, concerns about resistance. Um, and so, so I, I, I applaud that, um, that, that initiative. So hopefully that answers the question and I'll hand it off. Yeah, I, I mean, as it relates to Lynch syndrome, one of the more common questions we're getting nowadays is people, uh, are, a lot of our patients are becoming very aware of some really exciting research looking at the idea of whether you can vaccinate somebody with Lynch syndrome against the possibility of them getting cancer. A lot of this stems from the fact that Lynch-related cancers, when they're present, tend to respond very well to immunotherapy-type uh, approaches. Um, and so that's led naturally, I think, to the question of can you use imu immune-based approaches to prevent these cancers? Um, there's a number of vaccine trial efforts that are just starting to launch here in the United States, um, which are going to start off probably relatively small and relatively limited. But this is a, a, a very important and exciting topic. And I think that the opportunities for these trials are only going to grow with time. Um, so I, I guess I would encourage people to, to keep in mind that it's okay to maybe not be the first one through the door for, for some of these trials, um, that I think some of them are going to come and go very quickly. But I think these opportunities yeah, are only going to expand as we learn more. And chances are, with any sort of new approaches to medicine, you know, where we start at the, at the very beginning of some of these trials may not be where we ultimately end up when, when we understand this better. Um, so it's also okay to let some of the science unfold a little bit um, and, and see where things stand in the coming months and years, but it's an exciting time for sure. Excellent, yeah, and to your point, what you said, Heather, about using the fourth FORCE website. So we have our Enroll and Research tab um, where you can use our tools there to search for clinical trials that would be a good fit for you. Um, so that is a really good place to start. Kind of, we have time for probably about one more question and I wanna make sure that everybody here has the opportunity to answer it. And it really is looking to the future again. Um, we did have a constituent write in that said that they just read about a few new blood tests that can detect multiple cancers at a time. Um, for those of us who have, you know, mutations linked to multiple types of cancer, uh, should we consider these tests? You know, do insurances, will they pay for them? What are the downsides? Um, or is there a, a scale of what's good and what's not in terms of who is offering them? Um, so I will allow anybody here to jump in first, but we do want to hear from all of you on this. I'm happy to get started. <laughs> um, sure. and, and I, I would say that it's an exciting time in this direction, too. There's a lot of really cool technology. At the same time, I think we're still learning how to use a lot of this technology. Um, and for the most part, a lot of these new blood tests have specifically not looked at people who have inherited risks to cancer. They've, they've intentionally looked at people who have, quote unquote, average risk to cancer. Um, and so I don't know that we, I don't know that anybody knows how effective these tests are going to prove to be in people who have inherited forms of cancer risk. Um, it's also been very different uh, as far as which cancers these these tests seem to be good at 
identifying and which ones maybe not so much. So I think it's something that we would love to understand better and would it, we really need to study this in people who have genetic risks to cancer. You know, a theme that's come up, I think, just over the course of the panel here is, you know, the, the angst that can come from false positives or indeterminate findings. And I think until we understand these better, it's unfortunately just an, another opportunity to potentially have a quote unquote positive finding that we don't really know what to do with just yet. At least that's my two cents. I would agree. I think that was very well put. And so I see them as very exciting research opportunities. I don't see them as ready for prime time yet. I know that some of them are beginning to be available often in sort of, I guess we describe them as beta testing kind of settings, generally not covered by insurance, at least in my experience of people doing them and I don't order them. Um, but at any rate, you know, I think they're they're sort of percolating out there. And I think there have been interesting studies in terms of, for example, the Pathfinder study with one of these tests, basically looking at what happens when the test gets done and time to resolution again in average risk populations. I think that raised a lot of questions still to be answered. One of the concerns that I've had with some of these is that they seem to be detecting cancers in later stages, so sort of stage three and things like that. We can certainly do a lot better with, that with breast MRI, say, right, with, with many of these for high-risk women. I think for things like pancreatic, ovarian, some of the other more challenging cancers, there may be a role in time, but that is a research question at this point. Yeah, I think these are all excellent points, and I'm glad that um, both of my colleagues uh, touched on the false positive uh, issue because this basically just cranks up the heat on all of the um, psychological challenges of intensive surveillance. So depending on how often someone would be uh, screening and how specific these tests could be, uh, you know, it's... Uh, provides the um it, it provides almost like this um uh, hope for gaining a sense of control uh when so much is out of your control with hereditary cancer but um it also may have the function of keeping your focus on threat which keeps that anxiety uh revved up um i know i have plenty of patients who just want some time away from having to go to the doctor all the time and this may steer people in the other direction. I really agree with my colleagues' very insightful comments and yes, I think there's still a lot of unknowns and well-designed clinical trials will really help to answer some of these questions. Um, so yes, I think I, I agree. It's you know, I think there's great promise for this and other types of um, newer ways of early detection and prevention in the future. And we're just at the cusp of that um, and uh, look forward to, you know, um, having uh, working together to to um, have better and improved uh, solutions. I don't have a lot to add to all the really insightful comments that were given, but I am uh, completely in agreement. I think these are exciting, but not mature, and we have to study them together. Um, for people who feel like they want to participate, um, that's not for everyone, right? I think if you feel like it's already a little bit anxiety provoking, maybe that's not the right situation for you know, that's not the right context for one patient, but it might be something that would be uh, meaningful for a different patient. And, and I think certainly, um, you know, thinking about it carefully, and if you're going to proceed in the context of a clinical trial where there can be support and, you know, uh, clear guidance on how you might manage it um, in terms of the research pathway, but I'm looking forward to learning more and leveraging that moving forward as a community. Yeah, I think all of you have hit on such good points. I, I think a lot of what you said, especially Karen, was about having control, being able to manage anxiety. Um, and then as all of you echoed, there's a lot of information out there to digest for our constituents. Um, I do want to say that earlier in the day, our executive director and founder, Sue Friedman, did a wonderful presentation on a new tool that Force has created called Finding the Boast. Um, so it helps you determine in headlines 
what is actually factual information that you can take back to your doctor or your provider and ask them questions about. Also, our x-ray function, our x-ray program functions to do that as well to help you read in between the headlines and try to find facts. So as you're all trying to get through information and follow, you know, new studies that are coming out, please use those two tools um, because they will really help you determine what information is uh, information that you should move forward on and what information is a little bit less researched or approved. Um, so it's a good tool to have. At this time, we are going to wrap our presentation and our conference. Um, this is a good time for us to thank our sponsors, like I said, for bringing this programming to you. We'd also like to thank all of you for participating, registering, engaging in our chats, um, interacting with each other, really making this conference feel like we've been all together. Um, thank you to all of our panelists, our presenters, our force board, our force staff, our FORCE volunteers, they really are the bedrock of what we do here at FORCE. So if you were moved to engage further today and you would like to find out how to volunteer, please go to our website and look through our support services there and you can find out ways to become a volunteer and give your time back to FORCE. Please know that you are never alone and we are here to support your community. Thank you to our events team for helping us put on this great presentation. Have a wonderful evening, everybody.